from Las Vegas, it's The Cube. Covering Interconnect 2017. Brought to you by IBM. You're a startup, growing. Absolutely. You're working with like big banks. Yes. This is not easy. This is, normally is not they don't easy. work with startups at it all. It's not easy And at all. FinTech is exploding as a very big growth area. Um, so cloud kind of enables this. So to take us through some of the key points in your journey as CTO, yeah. you know, you're, you've nailed some big wins with some big established yeah. financial institutions. How'd you pull it off? What's the formula? Yeah, I, actually you can come and see my talk on Wednesday, I actually do that in <laughs> detail, but I could give you a, 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 a quick summary. So, so it, there's really, a, all along the way from the initial you know, pre-sales to you know, the, uh, the pitch sessions with the customers to the pilots, there are kind of learnings all along the way of the process. And I think uh, the number one thing is uh, white glove service. So typically, you know, from a scalability perspective, startups have been trained to you know, make it self-service, uh, uh, you know, API, you know, there's a, a developer portal, people can go Move in fast and, and, and break yeah. stuff. You know? but, but actually, <laughs> I, especially really. for the first set of customers, the white glove service is absolutely essential and, and really establishing the relationships at the ground level. So with the, not just the, on the business side, that's a given, but also with the, techno, the, the technical folks, the people at the banks that are doing the integrations, they can kill your project. And so really um, giving them a bit of a taste of our culture, I think actually it really excites them. So white glove them. service though, I've, if I yeah. hear this correctly, it's not just, being kind and being, you know, no. holding their hand. No. There's some technical table stakes. Absolutely. What are those table stakes? Because that seems to be the enterprise readiness yeah, matrix. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So I think the, um, the key is making tools that are very simple for developers to use. Uh, have developers love using your product because ultimately it's a technical integration. And so one of the things that we did is we created an SDK, both for iOS and Android. And it's not just service connectivity, but it's also the full user experience around receipt capture. And what that did is it precluded the need for the banks to go and build their own, uh, you know, build all the screens and all the workflows. We could come in and say right away, here, we have it for you. You can customize it, or configure it to make it look like your banking application, uh, to add your, you know, your brand elements to it. But ultimately, it allowed them in a very short period of time to bring on that uh, new feature uh, you know, the end user has, has no idea about Sensible. There might be a little logo at the bottom of the receipt that says it's powered by Sensible, but other than that, it very much fits in with an existing uh, banking application. And that's really important because, you know, because receipts aren't their space, we want them to, right out of the gate, have the, you know, the, the, a receipt capture uh, application that, uh, that's intuitive for end users, and, and this allows us to put it in their hand and just make it work for them. So that, that's really a big part of the success for and them. How, and you've, you've overcome that startup fear, right? Absolutely. How have you done that? So, uh, I mean, I think the, the advantage for me is I did spend my early career with IBM, so I spent about the thir first 13 years. So you were trained by IBM, so you kind of know. The I, I, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and so I, I was both in software groups, so working on e-commerce implementations, but sort of the middle part after that was in global services where I got to work with people in, 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 people in enterprise but across various sectors. And so that sort of gave me the confidence and really allows me to, to think in the same way that enterprise folks think, and, and so because we're not you know, a startup that's selling, uh, that, that has a platform where people are sharing pictures of sneakers, I mean, this is serious business, and, and yeah. not to belittle and other. And their brand, your customer's brand yeah. is on, in, on the line here. Absolutely, and, and so, so it, it really impacts everything we do, who we hire, the culture we try to build, how we present ourselves to our customers. I mean, it, it, it's sort of across the board, uh, the, you know, many considerations. Um, but I think also, like me personally, I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit. So I've always been, you know, hacking things together on, on the side. And uh, actually, in around 2010, when I left IBM, it was a, I had a previous previous startup. So this is number two for me. Um, but it was, I, and, and in fact, at IBM, I tried to actually do something entrepreneurial. Uh, but for me, actually, you know, B two B, especially you know, business to enterprise, is uh, for me is really the the sweet spot in terms of my skills, and, and it's hard, so I like that. I, I, like, I like a hard problem, and I would prefer that there's more barriers, um, and, and, and you know, it shows sort of in, in the uh, interest from our investors as well, is, is you want a, a business with moats around it, and, and certainly, you know, 
Financial institutions like banks can take two years to close a deal. I mean, it's a really long sales cycle. So you have so. the challenge. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, other than the, your past with IBM, yeah. you're also, what's the other IBM connection? You're running this on Bluemix? And, yeah, so, and so uh, we're running the solution on Bluemix. Uh, so we chose IBM for a number of reasons. I mean, one was their global footprint in terms of their data centers. Our customers uh, have certain SLAs they expect us to uphold. They uh, require that we have disaster recovery in place. And uh, so in Software uh, was very early in terms of bringing their data centers into Canada, so they recognized the opportunity there. And so we're both in Toronto and Montreal data centers. Uh, on, on top of that as well, uh, we've been part of the IBM Global Entrepreneurship Program. And so that's you know, given us some mentoring around how to scale our business, um, gave us some financial incentives as well. Um, on top of that, there are other relationships that we've explored with the services business in IBM. So, you know, could theoretically IBM be a preferred vendor for or integrator for our technology? And so there's a, there's a number of fronts that we're working with IBM. And, and I, I think also partly because my, you know, former relationship is, you know, my, you know I, I was an employee at IBM. In Canada um, or in the US? In Canada, so, you know, even, you know, our COO, for example, she was also at IBM. So kind of bringing the best talent uh, that I can find, um, people that are, you know, want to change in, in their kind of career and, and move from a large enterprise to a small company, we look for those. And you were in the before. software labs up there, and then, and then, so and originally. then, and then in, the, in the services group, you got the financial services domain expertise. And That's right. Brought the software Absolutely. And, and, and FS together. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and uh, I certainly would not have predicted all the excitement around FinTech when I started. I'm really pleased that I, I you know, magically, like uh, like through horseshoes and luck, like ended up in the right kind of the right place at the right time. But even from three when years, when you tackle of, hard problems, usually you end up in a good spot. Absolutely, yeah. So the hardest question, the hard question I want to ask you. This is a tough question. Yeah. So be ready. <laughs> Canadians or the Maple Leafs? <laughs> I'd have to say the Maple Leafs to be honest. <laughs> I'm from Toronto, so. Uh, <laughs> Unless the Maple Leafs lose, and then the Canadians <laughs> over the Bruins, obviously. Hey, as long as it, uh, <laughs> if there's a Canadian team, I'll be rooting for them. Of course, love the hockey in Canada, being from the Boston area. All right, now I want to ask you something more sentimental around the mm -hmm. culture. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned culture, which you were talking about your company yeah. culture. What's the cultural shift that you're seeing in the marketplace? Because you're talking about your startup that has cracked the code on a very hard problem with yeah. banks getting a customer. Yeah. So, you know, kudos and props for that. But also, there's, there's a whole DevOps movement that's going now to data, yep. where we heard some of the IBM execs pointing out the kind of counterculture that's developing. Yep. The younger generation are like, they don't, want, they don't want things the old way, they're doing things much different. Yeah. Can you comment about what your observations are around this cultural shift? Yeah, for sure. I, I think um, we've spent a bit too long in general paying lip service to the word innovation, and I think finally it's really coming to fruition, like real innovation, not innovation just for the sake of marketing, but really being able to innovate, um, and, and because the a subset of the, the you know the millennials that are coming you know coming up, they really have like you know, I guess they the, sort of the the culture of innovation has really been infused into their entire upbringing, and then they're they're really showing that in the workplace. So you see you know over the last say five six years the rise of hack days and these kind of things and and people that are also interested in solving problems that don't just have a, uh, you know, commercial outcomes to them. Uh, and, but what you find is that if you can align people's sort of passions and interests, um, and, and have them understand that if you go after this thing, uh, you know, your career will be set. And that's sort of the, some of the things that we try to do with our, you know, more junior resources, to let them know that if there's something that they're interested in, a, a problem they want to tackle, and it's aligned with where we're going from, a cor from corporate objectives, go after that because you will get what you want at Sensible. We want those kind of people that um, don't just pay lip service to, to innovation, but really you know, see something and, and are self-starting and can, can go after things on their own. I mean, I, I think there's also a big aspect of you know, social awareness and, the, and there's people on our team, and rightly so, that are concerned about ethical use of data and um, so we're, you know, at Sensible, kind of drafting up a policy, uh, just so internally we know and we can agree collectively on how we intend to use our data. So certainly not malicious purposes. We're not selling individual user data. Um, now the banks do have access. You know, the data collected through their systems is theirs. But ultimately, in terms of 
how we plan to monetize the insights, which is the next really interesting thing and, and things that I'm working on in, in 2017, really making sure it's done in an ethical way and so that you know, you have to... Just your next moonshot is to really kind of crack the code on yeah. the governance and Absolutely. the management of the data. But, but I think to get the right people, you also have to consider the social implications of using the data. People have to feel good about the work they do and there can be a lot of sensitivity around you know, the type of data that we collect. Well, Jamie, congratulations on the financing, your startup, Jamie Alexander, who's the co-founder and CTO of Sensibil. Check them out. Um, if you're a big bank, not many of them, so you have a, well, yeah, a small set of co potential customers. Congratulations on winning the big deals as a startup. Thanks that's a, so much. That's great news. Thanks for coming on theCUBE and sharing the startup story. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Keep watching it here. Stay with us for more coverage from Las Vegas after this short break. <laughs>